Last presentation is on reinforced concrete failure mechanisms. It's chapter E2 uh, in your uh, best practice manual. Uh, this talk is kind of an introductory talk, an overview talk for several other talks that you'll see or hear uh, later on in the week. So just a brief outline of what we're going to do is we'll start, we'll talk about the different types of structures, touch on the variation and different size, different types of hydraulic structures associated with reinforced concrete failure mechanisms. We'll talk about factors that uh, influence the strength and stability of reinforced concrete sections. We'll talk about national code requirements uh, in the context of risk analysis, how to use the code requirements and how not to use them. Um, we'll talk about how to consider structural analysis results in the context of a risk analysis meeting. And then <clears throat> at the end, we'll go through a typical event tree uh, progression of failure and talk about how to estimate probabilities for each event in that, in that event's failure sequence. Uh, so just some objectives for the course today, uh, this presentation today. Uh, we hope that uh, by the end, you'll have a broad overview of the different types of potential failure modes associated with reinforced concrete structures. Hope that you get an understanding of the different mechanisms that affect uh, reinforced concrete failures, and then under, and understand how to estimate event probabilities for a typical event tree. So just a summary of some of the key concepts, uh, reinforced concrete failure mechanisms are, are generally well understood. Uh, we have a good understanding of how concrete uh, fails um, and uh, how the material properties are well understood, but it's very important to consider uh, the types and duration of loading uh, for both static and seismic conditions, uh, consider the type of failure, whether it's a ductile or a flexural failure, versus a brittle or a shear type failure. Uh, and then just have a good understanding of how uh, reinforcement detailing has really changed over the years. And uh, it's very important to consider that detailing uh, in determining uh, the expected capacity that you have uh, for a reinforced concrete um, member. Um, and, and that there's certain assumptions that go in with the uh, equations that are provided in ACI that need to be considered by a risk team uh, in a risk team environment. Okay, so we're going to start with talking about uh, just geometry and support conditions. Um, I've been working on hydraulic structures for about 30 years now, and uh, one good thing about hydraulic structures is that uh, there's nothing cookie cutter about it. Um, there's all different kinds of shapes, sizes, different support conditions, as you can see here in this slide. Um, you can have uh, in the Upper left hand corner here, uh, this is Glen Canyon Dam, very uh, thick buttress, uh, thick structure with thick piers for the uh, spillway structure. Uh, this is uh, Canyon Ferry Dam, very thin uh, pier members for the gated structure. Uh, this is uh, uh, Coolidge Dam, uh, very thick buttresses. Um, so again, just a lot of variation in the different sizes and types of structures. Same with flood walls, uh, different types of loading, a lot of flood loading, barge impacts, uh, again, just a lot of different configurations and geom geometries. Same with uh, navigation locks and dams. So um, it's a good segue to this slide, which again, is just highlighting that, uh, you know, there's all different kinds of loading conditions to consider. You've got hydrostatic loading, hydrodynamic loading, uh, uh, soil uh, loading, um, and then just the variations of uh, the different types of structures. Uh, you have very tall, thin structures, uh, short uh, sections, and uh, different support conditions with bridge decks, hoist decks, all those kinds of different things. And, and those are gonna influence how uh, a structure behaves. So even the ACI code recognizes that uh, structures with height to width ratios of four to one or less tend to slide uh, more than rotate or bend, which is uh, what, uh, for taller structures, uh, they, they would tend to have, have more of a tendency to topple. Uh, so this slide is, is just to highlight that um, generally when we're talking about reinforced concrete failure mechanisms, we're talking about gated spillway structures that uh, the failure of which would result in an uncontrolled release of the reservoir. Um, however, there are situations where uh, there it's not a gated structure and you could be uh, a precursor to uh, another failure mechanism, for example, during an earthquake, if you were to lose a uh, spillway uh, sidewall um, at the toe of a dam, 
perhaps that could increase uh, exit gradients at the toe of the dam and it become an initiator for another potential failure mode uh, associated with internal erosion. So again, generally it's uh, gated spillway structures, but there are other things that need to be, other failure mechanisms that need to be considered by uh, risk teams. So this slide is just kind of Dynamics 101. Um, just to uh, highlight again, most of the times we're talking about seismic loading conditions when we get into team risk analyses. Um, and all this is slide is trying to highlight is that uh, the dynamic response of a structure um, is obviously very highly dependent on its natural frequency and uh, structures have a definite dy dynamic response based on their geometry and support conditions. Um, and that the time history record, um, the frequency content of that record um, is the more it's consistent with that natural frequency, the more uh, we would expect the structure to respond. Another key point here is that as structures get damaged, uh, their their natural frequency actually changes and adjusts uh, as the as that damage occurs, and that becomes an important point too uh, in the context of risk evaluation. So, structural response. Um, this is a page out of the back of your manual that shows um, for this chapter that shows that um, you don't necessarily have to do a finite element analysis to get a handle on natural frequency. There are some simplified equations for doing that. You just need to recognize that um, the structural response is also highly dependent on uh, the foundation conditions of the structure. Uh, structures like spillways that are founded on top of embankments can have their uh, ground, uh, the, the ground motion that they actually feel, the acceleration that they feel, uh, greatly amplified uh, because it uh, is on top of an embankment structure. So again, just some additional considerations for a risk team. Uh, now we're going to get into a little bit of uh, re reinforcement material properties. Uh, properties associated with reinforced concrete members, obviously very important. Uh, what this slide is trying to highlight for some of these older hydraulic structures, uh, you know, built uh, in, you know, 80, 100 years ago, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, uh, the evaluation um, being conducted, you won't know uh, exactly what the material properties are. Uh, in a lot of cases for some of the older structures, the specifications will even indicate that the reinforcement was provided by the, furnished by the government. Um, so just because you don't have that data doesn't mean you can't make an assessment on what material properties are. Um, for example, there are references that based on the vintage, the age of the structure, uh, you can estimate what the yield and ultimate strength is for the reinforcement. Um, and really the conclusion of a risk analysis may be such that there's enough uncertainty that uh, it may require or uh, point towards uh, actually going out into the field to obtain uh, these material properties. Same thing with concrete material properties. Um, you may have core data, you may not. Um, some of the improperties, obviously, that would go into an analysis of density, modulus of elasticity, compressive strength, tensile strength, and shear strength. But um, in most cases, um, really, that one of the key factors is the tensile strength. And, and um, you may have compressive strength data, but a lot of times you want to have tensile strength data. Um, and so some assumptions have to be made uh, regarding those. And again, what ultimately might be concluded is that it is uh, would be uh, beneficial to go out and get some core data and do some actual tensile strength testing. Uh, this slide is just on uh, consideration of construction joints. Um, you know, inevitably, it seems like when you're looking at uh, failure of these members, um, you know, you wind up the, the critical location is at, a, at the base of a structure at a joint. Um, and if that joint is unbonded, um, the team needs to consider that uh, you may not have uh, any tensile capacity uh, if it's unbonded or uh, again it's just always um, you know at an adversely uh, located location in terms of, of peak uh, moments and shears. Uh, okay reinforcement detailing again very important um, just going back to uh, college concrete class again ductile failures uh, failure mechanisms are better uh, than brittle or shear type failures. Um, the reason for that is that ductile failures uh, tend to provide some evidence that there's distress, uh, allowing for uh, intervention um, based on uh, the uh, observation of those uh, distresses. So as opposed to shear failures, which could be very sudden and brittle. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of 
determining whether you have a ductal section is very important, again, to make sure that it meets the minimum ACI code requirements and, and based, again, on, on uh, detailing, uh, historical detailing has changed significantly over the years. It's a very important consideration um, that you um, consider that uh, you might actually uh, fail uh, before you uh, get to that ductal behavior um, based on uh, inadequate detailing from on older structures. So again, uh, older structure hydraulic structures were not designed for current seismic loads. Um, we, we do have evidence that um, uh, reinforced concrete structures have performed well during earthquakes. Uh, the problem is, is that in a lot of most cases, we don't have a lot of information for some of these extreme uh, earthquake events, events and, and how they would perform under uh, significant loading. Uh, again, detailing is very important. Uh, and again, a lot of these older structures, insufficient embedment lengths, uh, splice lengths, hook details, um, that would result in, in sudden pullout failures before you actually get to uh, the expected capacity. So uh, the these massive hydraulic structures typically be uh, tend to be under reinforced. So you would expect some ductile behavior before you'd actually get crushing of concrete and flexure. Uh, in fact, in a lot of cases, they're uh, so under under reinforced that a, a lot of times. Um, it, it's beneficial for a team to even look at uh, the structure in terms of it being unreinforced and just a mass concrete structure. So structural system, uh, system considerations, uh, structural systems that perform well during earthquakes uh, dissipate energy through inelastic deformation. Uh, they alter their dynamic properties um, when uh, during earthquakes when they become damaged, getting that period shift. Um, and they mobilize additional strength elsewhere in the system. So they're highly redundant. Now, for hydraulic structures, uh, they tend to not be externally highly redundant. Um, what I mean by that is like, uh, you know, cantilever retaining walls, the load paths for them are, are, you know, very simple, not complicated at all. However, what, what finite element analyses have shown is that uh, they are hydraulic structures tend to be highly internally redundant, meaning that there's two mats of reinforcement with reinforcement going uh, both directions. And um, that allows for a lot of uh, redistribution of internal stresses uh, during dynamic loading. Again, uh, typically these structures have performed pretty well during earthquakes, um, but again, um, we're looking at seismic loads typically that ex extend beyond uh, the performance database that we currently have for these structures. So some analysis results considerations when evaluating, uh, you want to make sure that you're looking at true demand capacity ratios. Um, the team is looking at those when in the context of a risk analysis team. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, that progressive failure um, may be occurring in localized areas that are overstressed, but the team needs to consider that it may take multiple peaks uh, of overstress during the earthquake uh, for to actually result in failure. Again, that redundancy that we talked about. And ultimately, what I've found in these risk analysis meetings is it, it, it becomes pretty clear that there's going to be cracking, uh, there's going to be yielding, there's going to be damage, and then it becomes kind of a, a judgment call uh, uh, for the risk team to determine exactly what the extent of the damage is and whether it would actually result uh, in a failure. That's kind of the biggest challenge uh, in the context of reinforced concrete failure mechanisms. Uh, again, reinforcement detailing matters. This is just a couple slide, a uh, couple pictures here to kind of uh, illustrate that. Um, this is a column uh, in Turkey from the Kocha Ili earthquake in 1999. Uh, what this is trying to show is it looks like um, that there was uh, not sufficient uh, confining reinforcement. It looks like this was maybe some wire that was wrapped around uh, the primary column reinforcement, um, which I'm not saying wouldn't uh, have still resulted in failure of this column, but again, just kind of illustrates the importance of uh, detailing. Uh, this is a concrete retaining wall failure, even though this didn't result in an uncontrolled release of the reservoir. This is Shikan Dam in uh, Taiwan uh, during the 1999 Chi Chi earthquake. Uh, we've got a, a, a failure of a, a counterforded uh, um, retaining wall. Um, if you take a closer look at this picture, it's really hard to see any uh, reinforcement uh, pullout or, or breakage, so uh, which maybe calls into question some of the detailing uh, for this structure. 
So type and duration of loading, uh, static loads. Uh, again, most of the time when you're in a uh, risk analysis associated with a, a, a concrete failures, structural failures, it's it's in a in, in a seismic form. However, um, and the reason for that is because uh, for for static loading conditions, um, generally something would have to change dramatically either with the load or with the uh, concrete member itself. Um, for example, degradation due to alkali aggregate reaction before you would really uh, find yourself in in a uh, static uh, risk analysis for a concrete failure uh, uh, mechanism. But um, uh, it still is a consideration. Um, that uh, something that uh, needs to be evaluated in uh, screening potential failure modes. So uh, dynamic loads, both uh, earthquake and, and barge impacts. Uh, again, with earth, the cyclic nature of earthquake loading uh, requires that um, you know consideration of those peaks and how many peaks of stress uh, during the earthquake would be experienced before there's can be a, a real uh, assessment of what uh, what uh, failure would be expected. Um, barge impacts, they tend to be rapid and uh, of significant mag magnitude can cause a lot of damage. Um, just because the section is completely cracked through and we expect some yielding doesn't again mean that the member is going to fail. And that's again one of the bigger challenges for the risk team. So, and, and post seismic condition needs to also be considered uh, with that, uh, um, with damage. Um, could you get uh, a, a, that change in post seismic loading, which needs to be considered uh, by the risk team? So this slide uh, is just to highlight uh, there are some uh, ways of looking at uh, time history output from a finite element analysis. What this uh, what this graph shows, you've got uh, stress here on the y axis. Uh, and this is just a, a time history of stress output from uh, finite element analysis. And what it shows is these red lines represent the nominal expected capacity of the member. Um, and what we see here is we, we do have a couple of exceedances throughout the earthquake. Um, but again, uh, just a couple of exceedances uh, typically wouldn't be enough uh, to uh, fail a member uh, during an earthquake. And um, it just would something that needs to be identified and discussed. Just because you get one peak doesn't mean uh, you're going to get this uh, this failure. Again, code considerations. Uh, caution should be used when using uh, national codes. Again, uh, the detailing needs to be there to get the expected ductile behavior and capacity uh, that you're expecting from computing uh, capacity from code equations. Uh, I worked in the building seismic safety program. Uh, at reclamation uh, for several years, and and every single one of the beams in their power plants have uh, 90 degree hooks on them, um, and all in high seismic areas. And so, um, you know, the code would require 135 degree hooks uh, on those structures nowadays. But there are ways, and there are references out there. This a ASCE 31 seismic evaluation of existing buildings. Um, as a good reference for to try and take into account how uh, to adjust those capacities um, if should you um, have sections that don't meet uh, current code requirements. So this is an important slide. Uh, so uh, you know, in risk evaluation, it is a bit of a different mindset. It's not a design. Uh, you have to kind of get out of the design mindset. Um, you know, we have on the design side, you've got load factors, uh, which are intended to address uncertainties in analysis and design and loading. Um, and then you've got strength reduction factors on the other side of the equation to account for variations in materials and uh, construction. And effectively, those two combined uh, result in the uh, effective factor of safety for a design. So when evaluating a structure in a risk context, uh, we really want to strip out those load factors and those strength reduction factors. So we really want to be looking at demand capacity ratios based on expected loading and expected capacity. And then once you have those values, then it's up to the risk team to kind of factor in the conditions of the concrete, the severity of the environment, deterioration, uh, and, and just evidence of corrosion to 
kind of make a judgment in their pro in determining their probability estimates um, based on those factors given the actual DC ratios and, and how they would expect it to pro perform giving all those considerations. Okay, so just a typical event tree here. Uh, so uh, again, this is just kind of a, a starting template. Um, the event tree can be adjusted, but it does account for uh, the primary pieces uh, for a failure of, of reinforced concrete members. So the first is uh, evaluating concrete tensile stresses, um, and then uh, evaluating uh, reinforcement flexure um, and bending of um, bending and potential yielding of the reinforcement due to flexure. Uh, then evaluating uh, the section response to shear. Uh, and then displacement criteria, um, how much we actually expect it to uh, displace given its yielded or uh, uh, sheared condition. And then the last is kinematic stability. Does it actually uh, slide or topple? And we're going to walk through each one of these uh, nodes here on the event tree. So the first is uh, the cracking moment criteria, where we're going to compare the actual uh, demand moment to uh, the cracking moment capacity. Um, this is just a simple uh, stress equals MC over I type evaluation uh, where the concrete tensile strength is based on uh, the, uh, uh, the information provided in chapter E1 of your manual. Uh, I can tell you in a lot of cases in a risk analysis, it becomes pretty clear when you're looking at uh, some of these severe seismic loadings that the section is going to crack. And, and in a lot of cases, this node can even be left off the event tree with the un understanding that the probability is going to be one. But it is something that needs to be uh, evaluated and, and the team needs to agree that, yeah, the section is, is definitely going to crack uh, given the um, demand capacity ratio. Uh, next uh, event in the uh, sequence in the failure mechanism is evaluating uh, the, the moment demand. Um, and there's Two comparisons really that needs to be made is uh, evaluation relative to the expected nominal moment capacity based on ACI uh, equation, um, but also comparison with what's called the prob probable moment strength at plastic hinging. And really that's just a uh, evaluation of uh, assuming 25% that the bar gets uh, um, stressed uh, to 25% beyond yield. Um, so again, that's kind of the moment that you would expect to actually get a, a fully plastic hinge to form in the member being evaluated. So, um, and here's kind of a system response curve uh, associated with that evaluation. So here uh, you have on the x-axis uh, the computed demand capacity ratio, and then you've got the probability of flexural yielding. So, um, and and here. You've got, you know, anything less than M sub N here, you would expect elastic performance, and then anything beyond that, you'd expect this inelastic transition. So what this is showing that for a, a lightly reinforced section, uh, that the probability of failure might be, you know, something on the order of a, a demand capacity ratio of 1.1, whereas an adequately reinforced section, you might actually get to this, this probable moment at plastic hinging. Uh, again, just some tools to uh, complete this evaluation um, for evaluating flexural response. Um, this is uh, SP column, which is a, a program that's uh, very handy in terms of looking uh, at uh, interaction axial load and uh, moment capacity, the interaction diagram. Um, it's very easy to, to uh, pull in uh, time history data and plot to see, again, how many exceedances beyond the envelope uh, would uh, be expected uh, during an earthquake uh, time history record. Again, just to kind of get a sense of, you know, are we talking about one or two exceedances or are we talking about multiple exceedances? It helps just inform the risk team in evaluating uh, this particular node. Uh, next is section response to shear. Um, again, um, you know, with a with a brutal failure, uh, the response curve we would expect to be uh, uh, definitely more conservative uh, in terms of probability estimates. Um, so uh, again, you know, once you get to 1.0, a little bit above 1.0, you'd expect to have some pretty high estimates for uh, shear shear failure. So uh, the other thing that the slide 
highlights is um, that you, you a lot of these hydraulic structures are sized uh, based exclusively on concrete shear strength, which is fine as long as uh, there is uh, a minimal uh, a minimal amount of reinforcement uh, consistent with code requirements, again, to, to ensure that you kind of get that ductile behavior. Um, another thing that comes up a lot in evaluating shear is uh, the concept of shear friction reinforcement, um, which is fine to consider, but um, you need to make sure that this is being evaluated on a very defined failure plane. Um, it's not intended to be evaluated uh, as, as uh, shear at the end of a beam resulting in diagonal cracking. So there needs to be an established failure plane and uh, shear friction reinforcement should be supplementary to primary flexural reinforcement. Um, so just some considerations there in, in terms of evaluating shear. Uh, this is uh, just to illustrate that again, um, because these sections are lightly reinforced, uh, the section response to shear um, you could be just consider an unreinforced section uh, and use the traditional shear resistance equation where you've got uh, the resistance to sliding as a function of the normal force minus the uplift force times the friction coefficient plus uh, cohesion times the area of the sliding surface. And there are uh, references and, and graphs in the uh, charts in the back of your manual there that for this chapter that show how to estimate uh, these uh, the the determine the friction angle and the effective cohesion values for both unbonded and uh, bonded concrete joints. Uh, these are figures that were actually produced by the Electric Power Research in Institute. So note four is uh, displacement criteria. Uh, so again, once you get to the point where uh, the teams have determined that the structure that the section is going to yield. Um, you may be able to uh, get up to two to three times the actual yield displacement um, before the structure actually fails, fails. And this is based on some reinforce, uh, some research that was done by uh, Metasozin at the University of Illinois uh, Champ Champaign-Urbana, um, and um, where it, it was demonstrated that um, you know you could get yield up to two to three times the expected yield displacement before it actually fails. Um, so. There are uh, the computation of the yield deflection is pretty straightforward because you are on the uh, constant modulus a portion of the stress strain curve. The challenge is actually computing uh, for the team to compute um, the expected uh, deflection. Uh, most of the time, nonlinear finite element analysis is the best way uh, to do this, uh, but there are some simplified approaches that you can use uh, by just assuming one third to one half uh, the uh, concrete modulus of the a section to um, come up with a, a expected uh, deflection. And so the other thing that needs to be considered is, is secondary P delta effects as, as well in this in, in terms of this evaluation. OK, so uh, this would be a uh, response curve for that nonlinear displacement on this axis. You've got the probability of uncontrolled nonlinear displacement uh, given this computed nonlinear displacement ratio. Again, relative to if you've got a lightly reinforced section or an adequately reinforced section, um, the uh, you might have uh, different um, probability estimates for failure. So um, based on on those uh, values. So, uh, and then the last note is is just kinematic instability. Again, whether the uh, section would um, is more likely to slide or topple based on its configuration and its damage state. Uh, post, there are post seismic uh, considerations that need to be considered as illustrated here. If you had a, a yielded section with a permanently deflected wall, uh, you might have in the backfill that kind of fills in behind it, you might have some eccentricity relative to the stem of this wall that would uh, uh, induce new post seismic uh, loading on, on the section. So uh, just some takeaway points. Uh, the failure um, mechanisms for uh, various types of reinforced concrete structures are, are generally well understood, but there's a lot of uncertainty uh, of how these structures would perform uh, under extreme seismic loading conditions. Many failures have been uh, documented on navigation structures, um, but this is mostly from barge impacts. Um, and there's a limited number of failures uh, where um, uh, under expected design or seismic loads um, 
that uh, uh, we can use for these evaluations. So it becomes very subjective in a risk analysis. Um, even though material properties are generally well understood, um, there's limited, uh, there may be limited information uh, about uh, particular members. You may have to go out into the field to get supplemental information based on the outcome of the risk analysis. Type and duration of loading is very important. Uh, consideration for both ductile and flexural failures as well as brittle and shear failures is very important. Important, And, you know, again, the fact that uh, even over the last 30 years that I've been doing this, uh, the reinforcement detailings, details have changed dramatically and need to be considered in the context of uh, the capacity of, of these members uh, in, in when you're, they're being evaluated in a risk analysis.